Greetings, good people. This is Pastor Lachey. I'm just popping in to tell you what time it is. I know the clock in the wall gives us uh, a distinction of what time it is. Maybe our watches, our smart watches can tell us what time it is. But I really want to challenge you in thinking about what time it is. It's time for us to prepare for 2023. So in that, we are preparing seven days of seeking God as we've done in the past, but this year's a little different. We've got a lineup of guests and ministers and people who will be sharing the word of God, breaking the bread of life, and being used as gifts to help advance us into the work of the kingdom. We're reimagining grace. This is our 20th year um, pastoring here at Grace for the Nations Church, and I can't remember how many seven days of seeking God services we've had, but I want to invite you to put that on your calendar, January 1st through January 7th. But I also want to compel you to possibly sow a seed in advance. Um, I'm coming on here just to encourage you that if you sow into what it is that you're expecting to grow, you'll receive a bountiful harvest. So pray about that and consider sowing a sizable seed to help us to make sure that seven days of seeking God is the very best that it has ever been. Until then, God bless. Gracious greetings. My name is Anissa Harwick, and I want to welcome you to our fourth and final installment of the What a Love series. My lesson is entitled A Victorious Love, and I'm going to, my focus scripture is going to be Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. And I'm going to be reading in the New Living Translation. In this lesson, we will discuss how in God's love, we are assured, we are accepted, we are approved, and how his love towards us is absolute. But before we get started with this lesson, I want to open us up with a word of prayer. So let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for being God. I thank you for being almighty. I thank you for being all powerful. I thank you for this opportunity that you have given me to come before your people and share this lesson. Holy Spirit, I am completely dependent upon you to deliver this lesson. Flow through me, Lord. Let me speak your very heart and allow it to reach the heart of the hearers. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay. So again, our focus scripture will be in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. But I'm going to start reading at about verse 29. And again, it's going to be the New Living Translation, and it reads as follows. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dare accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he, haven't, 
Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that, that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we can see by reading these few verses, the God of all creation is for us. And if God is for us, who or what can successfully defeat or conquer us? This is com comforting reassurance in that Despite Satan, our accuser, constantly going to God with um, condemning things, things that would try to condemn us or discredit us, we can be assured in knowing that God is for us. There's a confidence in knowing that we've been justified and acquitted based on what Jesus did on the cross for us. It is important that I emphasize this fact because in life we're going to experience difficulties. We're going to experience things that may seem like failures or even defeats or even losses. But it doesn't mean that we're not destined to walk in victory or destined to be victorious. We've been equipped, empowered, and anointed to succeed. And there is nothing or no one that can stop us in Christ Jesus because victory is in our spiritual DNA. Christ's victory is our victory. Which this leads me to my first point. There is an assurance and a confidence in knowing that we're blood bought. There is something that when we are presented with adversity or opposition, there's something that rises up, a boldness that rises up on the inside of us that gives us a confidence in knowing that there's nothing that can stop us. There's nothing that can conquer us. When When we know that we are loved by Jesus, no matter what, there's a sense of security and an assurance that we have. We don't have to try to perform. We don't have to try to be perfect. Yes, perfection is maturity, but we don't have to try to act as if we have everything or, or act as if we know everything. It's okay to just be us. He created everything about us. God created everything about us, every hair on our head. He knows every thought. He knows every intention of our heart. He knows when we mess up. He knows when we think bad thoughts. Yeah, we should cast them down, but he knows everything about us. And there's a confidence that comes with knowing that even in that, he loves us. There's an assurance that comes with, I can just be me 
and all that that entails, the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent, I can just be me and God will still love me. There's an assurance and there's a confidence that comes with that. And yet do we stay at a place of um, thinking poor thoughts or thinking bad thoughts? No, the fact that he loves us um, despite it all gives us and empowers us to, to, to want to do better, to want to align with his word, to want to cast down those imaginations and those thoughts that exalt itself against the knowledge of who God called us to be and who he says we are. There's a boldness and an assurance that comes with that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand something. You are God's most valuable possession. And there is nothing, nothing that he would withhold from you. He didn't withhold his only son, Jesus. He gave his only begotten son for you. So there's nothing he wouldn't withhold from you. And Jesus gave his life. He was blameless without sin. And yet he sacrificed his life, was tortured, beat, mocked, lied on, spit on, crucified for you because he thought you were worth it. He thought you were worth it. And if God is willing to give his only son for you, please know that there's nothing that he would withhold from you. There's an assurance and a peace that comes with that. And this love and action, which is his crucifixion, his love and action ought to be enough proof that there is absolutely nothing that he wouldn't do for you, that he wouldn't do for us. There are no limitations to his love for us. We are assured in his love. And because he is completely and fully in love with us, this unconditional love ushers us into my second point. In God's love, we are accepted. God completely and fully accepts us. But this acceptance is only based on his acceptance for Jesus Christ. He accepted what Jesus Christ did for us. That's why he accepts us. Because people, let me tell you, apart from Christ Jesus, we are an enemy to God. And I know that sounds so cold and so cruel. We're, because we're his creation, we're God's creation. But outside of Christ Jesus, we are God's enemy. We are an enemy to the cross because we can either be for him or against him. And when we're not in Christ, we're an enemy to God. And, and that position was inherited to us in the Garden of Eden from um, Adam and Eve when they disobeyed. It separated us from God. It separated us from God and Ephesians 1, chapter 6, verse 7 tells us that according to God's good will, we are accepted in the beloved. So when we accept Christ, we're immediately accepted. And this acceptance, it's not merit-based. It, it can't be earned or bought. It's, it's not based on what we do or our abilities or efforts. It's strictly based on who God is and, and what he did for us. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17 says, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. That's when um, John was trying to, uh, John was baptizing Jesus. 
And then God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The same is true. It was like God saying, I accept him. I am in, in acceptance of what he is getting ready to do. I am, ex, I am in acceptance of it. And as we accept Jesus Christ, we have that same stamp of approval, that same acceptance. We are accepted in the beloved. We don't have to feel rejected. And we live in a world that, um, especially with technology and social media, that attributes um, the likes and the thumbs ups and the, 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 the winks and the nods, um, we attribute that to our self-worth and, and if our content is acceptable. In this world that we live in, everything that we do from Christ may not always be accepted by the world. We have to know that we are accepted in the beloved. We have to know that whether we are getting the likes or the approval when um, we do things, we have to know that we're accepted in Christ. We have to know that he, accept, uh, he accepts us because he accepted his son. And when we accepted Christ, that same acceptance is attributed to us. So we are accepted because um, Jesus redeemed us. He redeemed us through his blood and forgave our sins. Uh, when Jesus displayed his great love on the cross for us, it, it ratified us. And to ratify means to approve, which is my third point. When we accept Jesus Christ in our heart, it immediately sets in motion a legal binding agreement or contract of peace between us and God. So as soon as we accept Christ, that, that contract, that legal agreement of peace between us and God is set in motion. Um, earlier I spoke of how we're enemies to God based on what happened in the Garden of Eden, based on the disobedience between Adam, you know, with Adam and Eve. But when Jesus, when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord, it immediately, immediately, um, we're approved. We're approved by God. And again, this approval is not based on us doing everything right um, or us being good. It's based on Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for us. God's approval of Jesus is what is, is, is based on what that approval of us is, is granted to us. And I'm going to tell you, without Jesus Christ, we have no hope. We have no hope of being approved. We have no hope of being reconciled to God. We have no hope of being at peace with God. It was only through the precious blood of Jesus Christ that we um, were able to be accepted, to, were able to be approved. And Jesus is the only way. I grew up in a faith that believed that um, I could earn, by doing good things, I could earn my way into heaven. And people, I'm going to tell you, we are so valuable to God. And there is no amount of effort. There is no amount of good deeds or quote unquote works that we can do to try to balance the scales. The only thing the only thing that could have reconciled us back to our Father was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And his blood didn't come cheap. His blood didn't come cheap. It cost him everything. It cost him everything. It cost him his life. Yeah, salvation is free. But it cost him absolutely, absolutely everything. 
So it's important that we understand that our redemption came at a great price. And yeah, it's, it's through grace that we're saved, not of works, lest we boast, because we could boast about the works that we did to earn salvation. We could boast about that, but we rather boast in what he did on the cross for us. Jesus gave his life and he displayed a great love for us so that we could walk in that same love and share that same love with others so, so that we could live a sacrificial life poured out for him, poured out for him. And he did it while we were yet sinners. So he redeemed us and was thinking about us even when we were an enemy to him, even when we were an enemy to God, even when we were an enemy to the cross, he died and rose for us and he did it once and he did it for all of us. And it wasn't based on um, what we look like. You know, society will accept or approve us if we look the right way if our skin tone is the right color, or if our hair texture may be the right texture, or if our nose is the right shape. But God doesn't look at that, he looks at our heart. He died and rose for each and every one of us despite those outward things because we're his creation. He created us, he formed us, he shaped us in his image and in his likeness. And he did it once for all of us. When he died and rose for us, Jesus did that once and he did it for all of us. So salvation is free and it costs Jesus everything. And he did it so that we can have peace with our father. Um, and this is an honor that we don't deserve. But Jesus paid the price for us. And Satan would love to make us feel as though we're not worthy. And people, let me tell you, when we act as though we're not worthy or we walk in condemnation, it's like saying the blood of Jesus Christ is not enough. It's like what he did on the cross wasn't enough. We're worthy because Jesus' blood says we're worthy. So in Christ, we're no longer condemned and we can stand in assurance and acceptance, fully knowing that we are approved because of the finished work on the cross that Jesus did for us. And all of this is relevant. His birth, his life, his death, his burial, his ascension, his resurrection, all of it is relevant and all of it was necessary. And it is finished. It is finished. He settled it for us. His love towards us is absolute, which is my final point. His blood did it all for us. We can come to Christ and know that his blood did it all for us. It wasn't our parents. It wasn't anything that we did. It wasn't any of that. It was his blood that did it for us. His blood that was on full display that showed a victorious love towards us. He sacrificed everything because he thought we were worth it. Now all we have to do is receive the gift of this sacrificial love, the gift of salvation. And when we truly receive this victorious love, we will be able to freely give it and we can walk in the purpose and plan that God has for us. We can walk in victory in what God purposed for us and possess the land that he purpose for us to possess and we can do it in victory let us pray
Father in heaven, I thank you. I thank you for loving us with an everlasting love. I thank you for the assurance and the confidence and the boldness that you give us and knowing that we can come to you and call on you and you hear us. Thank you for the assurance in that and knowing that when we speak to you, it's not falling on deaf ears. You hear us and you answer us. Lord, I thank you that you accept us and you approve us. We don't have to worry and clamor and fight and, and wonder if we're good enough for you. You accept us. You accept us completely. You love us completely. Our love for you is not contingent upon your love for us. Your love for us is without condition. Your love for us is thorough. It's absolute. I thank you for that love, Lord. I pray that we can receive each and every person under the sound of my voice will receive that love, that victorious love, that unconditional love, that love that you gave when you gave your only begotten son, that love that will change us into your image and into your likeness. Let us receive that love so that we can love you with all of our heart, all of our soul and all of our strength. And we can love one another as ourselves. We won't condemn others reject others based on how they look or where they come from or what their status. God will love them right where they're at because they're your creation. You created us in your image and in your likeness. So help us to love one another. Father, thank you. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you. God bless you.